Okay. So good morning to all of you and I Shubhodeep Konar on behalf of the Department of English and Internal Quality Assurance Cell Kandhi Raj College welcome you to the day one of online lecture series organized by the Department of English and IQAC under the patronage of Dr. Shoma Dutta, Principal Kandhi Raj College. We are privileged and honored to have with us today as our speaker, Ms. Orpita Ghosh, Assistant Professor, Ramanondo Centenary College, Purulia. I think that in the kind of toughest times we are facing now, this online lecture series will be very much helpful for all the enthusiasts. That is why we have arranged and organized this online lecture series. And now I request our respected principal madam to give a speech and to welcome our chief guest today, that is our speaker, Mish Ghosh. Over to you, madam. Thank you, Shubhadeep. A very good morning to all of you. I, on behalf of Kandiraj College and my own behalf, heartily welcome you all in the today's online lecture series program being organized by Department of English in collaboration with IQSE of this college. Today, in this event, we are privileged to have amongst us Ms. Orpita Ghosh, Assistant Professor in English at Ramananda Centenary College, Purulia. She has also taught courses in Law and Literature at National Law University, Jharkhand. Madam, warm welcome to you. I also welcome to all of my colleagues, students, research scholars who are participating in this program through YouTube streaming. I passionately welcome to convener of this program, Mrs. Moshumi Dash and other members of Department of English and members of IQSC who are worked hard to make this program a great success. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, <clears throat> for your precise speech and your fine gesture to welcome our chief guests today. And now, without wasting so much time, because I know every listener uh, is now eagerly waiting to listen to uh, Ms. Ghosh's lecture. So I am handing over the entire platform to you, madam, and over to you now. Thank you. And I, I, I truly am thankful to our respected principal, madam, the patron of this uh, online lecture series because without your motivation and guideline, everything uh, will remain incomplete. And so thank you very much, madam. Thank you. And now uh, to madam Urpita Ghosh. And I would request you to deliver your lecture and to enlighten us. Thank you. Over to you, madam Urpita Ghosh, madam. Uh, thank, uh, you, thank you so much, you. Shubhudi. Shubhudi. Uh, I want uh, to begin by uh, thanking, thanking uh, uh, Dr. Shoma Dattu, uh, respected principal of Kandiraj College, for her very capable leadership and for uh, patronizing this uh, series of lectures. I want to also thank the English department and uh, the internal quality assurance cell of the college. Uh, I understand uh, how uh, difficult it is to navigate the online world in these times. Uh, but we are all trying in our own ways. And I want to congratulate Kadiraj College in uh, uh, putting together this event. All right, so um, I will be talking about uh, In Custody, novel by Anita Desai. And I'll be focusing on uh, masculinities, men and masculinities in the novel, particularly through the prism of vulnerability. So that is something that I'll be focusing on uh, throughout the length of this discussion. Uh, I'll also uh, expect uh, 
I hope there'll be a discussion at the end. Uh, so uh, we'll be able to talk about uh, certain concepts in detail, which I will only sort of touch when I'll be discussing. So uh, Anita Desai is an Indian novelist and uh, professor of humanities at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Uh, she has been shortlisted for the Booker Prize thrice. She received a Sahitya Academy Award in 1978 for her novel Fire on the Mountain and has won the British Guardian Prize for her novel The Village by the Sea. Desai was born in 1937 in Masuri, uh, India, uh, to a German mother and an Indian father, Bengali Indian father. Her parents had met in Germany, had moved to India thereafter, and Desai subsequently spent her life in New Delhi, Bombay, Calcutta at various times. Desai says that she grew up speaking Hindi with her neighbors, only German at home. And when she went to school, she learned to read and write in English, which then became her literary language. Among Desai's important works are uh, The Artist of Disappearance, uh, 2011, uh, Fasting Feasting, Baumgartner's Bombay, In Custody, the novel we are discussing today, The Village by the Sea, uh, Cry the Peacock, and so on. Anita Desai has said in one of her interviews that while she feels about India as an Indian, she thinks about it as an outsider. And this will be something that we'll keep coming back to, even when we discuss in custody. We'll see that, uh, we see that in Desai's work, uh, she has explored the lives of outsiders within Indian society and more recently also within the West. Her fiction has covered themes such as women's oppression, quest for a fulfilling identity, uh, family relationship and contrast, the crumbling of traditions and also anti-Semitism. Uh, her work has also been compared to those of modernist writers such as T.S. Eliot, William Faulkner, Virginia Woolf, because of how her novels and short stories evoke characters, events and moods. Uh, I want to talk about uh, talk a bit about one of her novels, Baumgartner's Bombay, before I move to In Custody and before I move to the topic of masculinity itself. Uh, and we'll see, uh, and I'll try to keep it short. So uh, in Baumgartner's Bombay, uh, the protagonist, Hugo Baumgartner, is a Jew who fled from Nazi Germany to India, only to find that he cannot be fully accepted by Indian society either. So he's first interned in a camp for Germans uh, during the Second World War and then remains a Firangi, a stranger in post-colonial India. In the end, Desai shows us that his escape is meaningless. His escape is pointless as he's killed by a German drifter whom he's trying to set free uh, from drug, drug addiction. Uh, I'm quoting from Desai's interview. This I claims that, quote, my characters who appear like losers, victims, show a kind of heroism of survival. I think if you can come through the experience of life with the heart and mind intact without compromising yourself, that to me is a heroic act that needs to be celebrated. And so in Desai's novels, her characters, in spite of their heroic struggles, come to often tragic endings. I uh, will now move on to the discussion of masculinity very quickly, just a brief overview of masculinity studies. Uh, so literature reflects and shapes our ideas about ourselves, our societies, and our relationships with other humans, right? And as such, historically, thinkers and writers and critics have come to use social and sociological concepts of gender, race, class, caste, sexuality, ability, to discuss how the representation, because literature is representation, like other media. So for example, Toril Moy, uh, in talking about conditioning and socialization, distinguishes between three terms, feminist, female, and feminine. Moy says that the first term, feminist, is a political position. The second, uh, female, is a biologically determined position while the third, feminine, a set of culturally defined characteristics. 
Similarly, men's studies or masculinity studies takes up the study of social relations, of gender, and how, and how men are also conditioned to follow cultural standards of maleness and of being masculine. And uh, a critic called Raven Cornell has developed a social scientific analysis of masculinities as part of a broader relational theory of gender. For Cornell, gender is the end product of ongoing interpretations and of definitions placed upon the human body. Masculinities and femininities can be understood, therefore, as the effects of these interpretations. In Cornell's account, masculinities occupy a higher ranking than femininity in the gender hierarchy in Western societies. So at the very top of the gender hierarchy is hegemonic masculinity, uh, which is the culturally dominant ideal of masculinity centered around authority, physical toughness and strength, heterosexuality, uh, paid work. This is an ideal of masculinity that few actual men, and I don't think any man, uh, can live up to. But those who gain most advantage from this ideal, Cornell calls the, the next level, which is complicit masculinity. So you've got hegemonic masculinity, those who benefit from it uh, are complicit and therefore uh, complicit masculinity. Below this are subordinated or marginalized masculinities, which is uh, a form of masculinity that includes a range of masculine behavior, which does not fully match up to the macho ideals of hegemonic masculinity. So think of ideas such as uh, boys don't cry or mard ko dard nahi hota, which are basically telling you that men who cry or men who express pain mm -hmm. are not men enough and are so subordinated, uh, uh, belong to the category of subordinated masculinities. Uh, at the very bottom of this gender hierarchy are femininities. And femininities also take on various forms. So femininity can be emphasized femininity or resistant femininity. But it's important to remember that femininity is always subordinated to masculinity. So in Cornell's analysis, the social changes of the 20th century uh, have undermined this gender hierarchy and has opened up discussions. And this is where men's studies, masculinity studies, comes in uh, because now uh, these categories, these positions are rendered unstable and uh, women's studies and men's studies together uh, can trouble these categories of hegemonic and what constitutes hegemonic and what constitutes complicit and so on. So my next uh, point then is what do we mean when we uh, say that we are doing literary masculinity studies. I think it's important to have a few ground rules in mind before we go on to the discussion of a literary text with reference to masculinity studies. So number one, uh, it's important to remember that literary masculinity studies, like other gender studies approaches, uh, be it queer studies or women's studies, uh, approaches literature uh, from a sociological point of view. So sociology, we have borrowed terms from sociology when we are talking about uh, these approaches. Secondly, uh, there's a very interesting difference between women's studies and uh, men's studies because women's studies has been so uh, privatized, has been so invisibilized, so pushed out of the range of public discourse outside the mainstream, which can, call, which can be called the male stream. So you think of history, not her story, and uh, all of that. And you realize that women's lives have to be excavated, have to be uh, brought uh, into the foreground because they have been so shut out. On the other hand, men's studies has no such problem because men are everywhere. Men have clearly been the subject of scholarship. So although the... Uh, impulse of men's studies remains the same to that of other gender studies. So the impulse is to analyze and appreciate the individual and socio-historical cultural formations uh, over universal norms. The reason we are doing this for men's studies is different because men have been uh, 
so much in the background that they have been rendered invisible, we need to make them visible through uh, masculinity studies. And for example, take the example of white men. White men, uh, if you think of white men, you're thinking of the universal norm. Anything that you think about, the first image that comes to mind is uh, of a white man doing uh, whatever we are envisioning them doing. So white men benefit from the invisibility thrust upon them. And in the process, the specificity of their race and their gender, so race and gender, uh, otherwise so visible on our bodies, on other bodies, on black bodies or uh, disabled bodies, is something that is carried invisibly by white men. So it is uh, essential that men are part of the gender debate. When we talk about gender, we are not only talking about women uh, or other alternate uh, genders, uh, not simply for the sake of parity, but also because presumptions of masculinity are damaging to men as well. So there are reports, there are, there are uh, report after, there's report after report, which talks about high male rates of ulcers, suicides, heart attacks, earlier deaths. Uh, so rather than reinforcing patriarchy, which we think we might think is beneficial to uh, men, uh, men's studies, literary masculinity studies challenges this idea and uh, shows us how patriarchy can be damaging to men as well. And finally, men's studies seeks to explode the myth that men in general benefit from patriarchy and uh, literary masculinity, masculinity studies aspires to celebrate multiplicity of masculine identities over uh, socially embedded stereotypes. So like to put it in a, a one line, uh, when I say man, you don't think of, I don't want you to presume a white or an upper caste, able-bodied, heterosexual, cisgender man. Just as feminism has challenged the idea of a woman being by default white, able-bodied, heterosexual. Uh, similarly, men's studies also presumes uh, to, to challenge your presumptions about uh, what we say when we say men. All right. So uh, with that, I will now go into the discussion of In Custody, 1984 novel, Booker Prize shortlisted novel. Uh, the novel is set in Mirpur, uh, a small town outside Delhi. It is also partially set in Delhi, uh, Chandni Chowk. Devain Sharma, the protagonist, teaches Hindi at Lala Ramlal College. He leads a dreary existence in a small town, but he has one passion, which is Urdu poetry. Uh, his friend Murad, college friend Murad, gives him the offer to interview Noor, one of the last living legends of Urdu poetry, uh, for his magazine Awaz. Devain, uh, after some hesitation, takes up the offer. He visits Noor's house in the heart of Chandni Chowk. Uh, but once he gets there, his notions about uh, Noor and uh, his idol start falling apart. After a lot of indecisiveness, Devain decides to interview him. The interview ends in a fiasco. Uh, the project fails. I want to begin with Devain's uh, character and how Desai has uh, presented his character from the very first chapter. Devain is an uninspiring teacher. Primarily, we are told, because Hindi is not his first love. Poetry, uh, especially Urdu poetry, uh, that his school teacher father had taught him to read and recite, is his true love. Forced to be the man of the house, after his father passed away young, Devain leads a timid, meek life. In the first chapter itself, we are shown how Murad, Devain's friend, forces Devain into agreeing to interview Noor. The language is telling. Devain's masculinity is subordinated to Murad's, Murad, the childhood bully. 
I'm quoting from the first chapter. Murad asks Devin, look, will you do this feature for me or not? Devin answers, of course, I will, Murad. He became meek. He hung his head, looking at his fingers, clutching the edge of the table. On each fingernail, a pale cuticle loomed bleakly." Unquote. In the second chapter, in chapter two, as Devin travels to Delhi using his leave, uh, we are told that he's wearing, quote, pale green nylon shirt that crackles with latent electricity, reminding him how it had arrived with his wife after her last visit to her parents' home in Haldwani, an ingratiating present to their sullen son-in-law who had to be placated and kept contented if their daughter was not to suffer from ill treatment. He had tossed it onto the floor in an obligatory fit of temper. The meek are not always mild. Saying the color was one he detested, that the buttons did not match, that the size was too large, large. how could they have chosen such a cheap garment for their son-in-law? Unquote. The family is an important place of gendered socialization, of the way in which individuals construct themselves as gendered beings within a normative social and cultural context. The family contributes to the reproduction of masculinities, but it can also constitute a place of emancipation and subversion in relation to gender norms. By performing the sullen, ill-tempered son-in-law and by subordinating his wife, Sarla, Devin's subordinated masculinity aspires to be complicit, forever trying to shift to higher ground. This trait of hegemonic masculinity, which seeks to constantly shore itself up by denigrating the subordinate and the feminine, is on display throughout the novel. Uh, in chapter four, for instance, we are told how, and I'm quoting, usually he was enraged by her tacit accusations. Uh, this is Devin talking about Sarla, how Devin was enraged by Sarla's tacit tacit accusations that added to the load on his back. To relieve it, he would hurl away dishes that had not been cooked to his liking, bowl uncontrollably if meals were not ready when he wanted them, or the laundry not done, or a button missing, or the small son noisy or unwashed. It was to lay the blame upon her, remove its clinging skin from him. Tearing up a shirt she had not washed, turning the boy out of the room because he was crying. He was really protesting against her disappointment. He was out to wreck it, take his revenge upon her for harboring it. Why should it blight his existence that had once shown promise and had a future?" Unquote. The most understood and uh, valued idea of masculinity is based on the dominance of men, other men. Uh, and subordination of women and all that they represent. Feeling pressured to meet narrow masculine ideals restrict how many men engage with each other and with women. It's also important to note that not all men benefit from masculinity in the same way. A man's race, body shape and other identities influences connection to masculinity and experiences of feeling safe, authoritative and respected. Connell says that all men complicitly benefit from the masculine privilege at the expense of women. And this is something that uh, also happens in Desai's text. Led by the creative power of poetry, Devin finds solace in reading, reciting, writing Urdu poetry, itself a language with fast diminishing balance in the changing uh, landscape of post-colonial India. Devi's idol is the Urdu poet Noor Shah Jahanabadi, one of the last living poets writing in a dead language. Desai here deftly begins to conflate the two. Devi's vulnerability as a masculine, uh, as a marginalized man, Noor's aging masculinity, and together the lament for a language that is fast dying, taking away its once held cultural and social capital. At the, house, at the house party, surrounded by small-time poets and hangers-on, Devin watches in shock as Noor, the dignified poet, 
eats noisily, dribbling food all over himself, drinks and groans curses, and says, quote, you recite verses as if they were nursery rhymes your mother had composed. We need the roar of lions or the boom of cannon so that we can march upon these Hindi walas and make them run. Let them see the power of Urdu. And at this, one of the young men present there counters, quote, wah, wah, very fine, very fine. Uh, mocked a young man. He calls for attack 30 years after his claws have been extracted and his teeth filed. You are laughable, my friend. Laughable. How do you expect to attack? With what weapons? Alliteration and metaphor. If you want arms, you had better cross the border and go find them in Pakistan. Here, we live as hijras, as eunuchs. Unquote. The evocation of the figure of the eunuch as a stand-in for the descent of a language collapses the two running motifs of the novel here. Language is male. Language is phallocentric. Hegemonic masculinity fears nothing more than the male homosexual and the feminine. The emasculation of a language is therefore the worst fear of the masculine. Devin's own fragile masculinity is further threatened by, the, by seeing the state of Noor's decaying, aging self. He constantly vacillates between admiration and horror at the old male body of Noor. I'm quoting uh, this from chapter four. In the midst of all the shadows, the poet's figure was in startling contrast, being entirely dressed in white. His white beard was splayed across his chest and his long white fingers clasped across it. He did not move and appeared to be a marble form. His body had the density, the compactness of stone. It was large and heavy, not on account of obesity or weight, but on account of age and experience. He was still at a moment of completion, quite whole. Unquote. It is common knowledge now that male sexuality has been defined as eminently phallocentric across cultures and centuries, as the critic David Leverance reminds us, the erect penis has been the most basic synecdoche for a man's virility and force. No wonder then that the loss of sexual prowess, which has been traditionally associated with older men, has been represented as a deeply gendered issue. Sexual impotence being repeatedly depicted as itself a metaphor for diminished manhood and virility. In In Custody, Devain is shocked when Noor rages at him, saying, Wait till you are my age, he spat. You boy without hair. Wait till you experience the afflictions I know. I sit upon them daily. Not my crown, but my throne of thorns. That is what piles are, my friend. Oh, the pain, the suffering, he nearly wept, standing there in the middle of the room, wringing his hands while he waited to be led out. Unquote. The masculine fear of uh, pain and suffering is also contrasted with the pain of losing a young, strong male body. At one point, Noor, who uh, is very interested in wrestling, uh, says of the wrestler Bhim Singh, but Bhim Singh, the greatest of them all, he's finished, his career is over. And Noor says, he can never be finished. Noor protested, I have felt his muscles like rocks, like boulders. In a classic study, The Coming of Age, 1970, Simone de Beauvoir rightly noted that the aging male is, quote, the specter that haunts the most virile of men. In the old man, he hates his own future state. And here I want to introduce the term vulnerability to mark this anxiety around loss of control and fear of suffering in one's old age. I want to move from the term fragile, which I had been using up to this point, to shift to this term vulnerability. Vulnerability refers uh, to the inability of a person or a system to withstand the effects of a hostile environment. It's a particular time frame. It could be a time frame which could be extended uh, within which one's defensive measures, one's defenses are lacking, compromised, or diminished. So uh, over the last year or so, we have, we have understood uh, the costs of vulnerabilities. For example, uh, 
certain groups are more vulnerable uh, at particular time periods. So during the pandemic, we have seen how certain groups were uh, disadvantaged, migrant workers for one, women uh, in abusive uh, relationships were at greater risk uh, during this pandemic. Climate change has rendered uh, certain groups of people more vulnerable than other groups of people. Devin, to come back to the novel, reveals his vulnerability to Noor for the first time in the novel. So far, we have felt his helplessness, but for the first time, Devin articulates that in terms of the demands of patriarchy and hegemonic masculinity, giving us a window of vulnerability. I'm quoting, uh, this is Devin. I studied Urdu, sir, as a boy in Lucknow. My father, he was a school teacher, a scholar and a lover of Urdu poetry. He taught me the language, but he died. He died and my mother brought me to Delhi to live with her relations there. I was sent to the nearest school, a Hindi medium school, sir. They went stumbled through the explanation. I took my degree in Hindi, sir. And now I'm temporary lecturer in Lala Ramlal College at Mirpur. It is my living, sir. You see, I'm a married man, a family man. But I still remember my lessons in Urdu, how my father taught me, how he used to read poetry to me. If it were not for the need to earn a living, I would, I would, should he tell him his aspirations, scribble down on pieces of paper and hidden between the leaves of his books, unquote. This vulnerable masculinity is sustained and shattered in Devin's interactions with Noor throughout the novel, especially when they're alone. At one point, Noor praises Devin's pronunciation of Urdu uh, and, and says to him, do you remember more? And Devin, swaying upon the stool, recited on and on in a voice that grew increasingly sing-song. As he continued, he began to be overcome by the curious sensation that he was his own mother, rocking back and forth on her heels as she half sang, half recited a story in the night, and that the white bolster-like figure on the bed beside him was a child, his child, whom he was lulling to sleep. He understood completely in these minutes how it must feel to be a mother, a woman, he had not known before such intimacy, such intense closeness as existed in that dark and shaded room where his voice merged with those of the pigeons to soothe the listening, lulled figure before him. Wonderful, isn't it? Uh, this social, affective, intimate space between two men one made vulnerable by socioeconomic factors, the other by loss of language and age, is made visible only to be made unsustainable because in Anita Desai's fictional universe, there is no redemption. And I want to draw your attention to another story. I'm sure uh, many undergraduate students uh, are familiar with the story, Catherine Mansfield's The Fly. Uh, in in In... Mansfield's short story, uh, she offers a temporary ritualized space for the boss to mourn his son, his son who had died fighting in the uh, First World War, who tries to cry, the boss tries to cry, but ultimately fails because the masculinity scripts that he's following, the script that he's following, refuses to give up control and authority. And because it's predicated once again, uh, upon a detest of the subordinated female, female, almost female, feeble, frail, masculinity of Woody Field, because he's under the control of his wife and his daughters. Uh, the novel goes on, in custody, uh, goes on uh, depicting uh, Devane's struggles, his constant attempts to uh, get to a place of uh, satisfaction, his struggles with money. In custody then becomes an enactment of the vulnerabilities that masculinities must negotiate. 
Desai says in an interview that I'm quoting Desai here, women, perhaps mostly Indian women, have a life presented to them and they have to make the best of it. Women tend to accept the life that is given to them and to exercise whatever control they can within those parameters. Whereas a man is expected to move further beyond them and there lies danger, unquote. The word control keeps popping up again and again when we are talking about uh, masculinity um, and even within Desai's fictional world. Masculinity then is a cultural construct that may be defined at its core by certain physical features and an inner sense of being male. It is characterized by traits such as toughness, power, control, independence, differentiation from womanhood, restricted emotions, physical, sexual competence, assertiveness, and aggressiveness. Although these ideal qualities may not be held by all men, these traits are culturally constructed to inform what a real man should be within our socio-cultural environments. And this can be considered our culture's hegemonic masculinity script. These scripts might be different. What might be considered masculine 100 years ago might not be considered masculine today. It leaves all those who enact these scripts every day vulnerable, traumatized, resigned. But one would also like to believe that it also exposes the constructed nature of these scripts, rendering hegemonic ideas of masculinity and femininity unstable and open to interpretation. And that is all I think literature can aspire to, to do at the moment. I want to end uh, this discussion today by uh, with this quote from the last chapter of the novel. Devain is defeated by his circumstances. He's threatened by the loss of his job. He's pleading with Noor, uh, sorry, Noor is pleading with him to save him. Devain is overwhelmed. This is how Desai describes Devain's state of mind. He was hurrying along the path now, walking through the weeds and grasses that caught at him, tearing at the loose pajamas on his legs and at his feet in their open sandals. Brushing them aside, he tried to return to his old idolatry of the poet, his awe of him, his devotion, when it had still been pure, and his gratitude for his poetry and friendship. That strange, unexpected, unimaginable friendship that had brought him so much pain. He had imagined he was taking Noor's poetry into safe custody and not realized that he was, if he was to be custodian of Noor's genius, then Noor would become his custodian and place him in custody too. This alliance could be considered an unendurable burden. And this is something that we have been talking about, right? The burden of being a man. This alliance could be considered an unendurable burden or else a shining honor. Both demanded an equal strength." Unquote. I'd like to end with this quote. I'd like to leave you with this quote because it seems to encapsulate the point that I've been making so far. I'll stop here for now and see if there are any questions, uh, anything that we could talk about. So yeah, I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you. Okay, so again, thank you uh, on behalf of the Department of English and IQAC for delivering this wonderful lecture focusing on the very aspect of how the fragile masculinity is transformed into vulnerable masculinity in Anita Deshai's uh, In Custody. So again, I uh, honestly thank Ms. Urpita Ghosh, Assistant Professor of Ramanandu Centenary College, Purulia. And so I think that all the listeners uh, are still present here and if you have any question, please write down the question in YouTube comment box so that we can communicate that question to 
Ms. Urpita Ghosh and she will answer them ready. Any, is there any question from any of you? Please, if you have any question, just, just uh, write it down in the comment box of YouTube. Madam, uh, we are waiting for one minute for driving a question. Okay, then. Please, if you have any question, write it down in, in the YouTube comment box. We'll be waiting for one minute and then we will end up uh, the day one online lecture series. I think uh, there is no question from the listeners. Okay, we have we have a question now. Okay, madam, I am. What is the condition of Urdu language in the modern society in the novel in custody? I am I am repeating the question. You can also see that from YouTube stream. But I am repeating the question. What is the condition of Urdu language in the modern society in the novel in custody? Oh, so, uh, uh, yeah, oh, no, no, no. Yes. As the as uh, uh, so could you mute mute yourself? Mute yourself. Yeah, obviously. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, in the novel, uh, as they say, portrays Urdu. She portrays it as a decaying uh, language, a language that has uh, that does not hold much power in post-colonial India. We have two figures in the novel. We've got, of course, Noor, Noor Shah Janabadi, the Urdu poet. Uh, we also have Siddiqui, the uh, lecturer at the Urdu department at uh, Devens College. And both these figures are portrayed as figures uh, stripped of any social, uh, cultural, uh, uh, capital within the economy of the novel. So Siddiqui, who seems to be quite enthusiastic in the beginning, towards the end, entirely gives up on the project. Uh, we realize he's living in a decaying mansion, which will soon be sold to promoters. Noor uh, continues to live his days surrounded by uh, people who are only there to mooch off of him. Uh, so within the uh, economy of the novel, Anita Desai has portrayed Urdu as a language which is fast uh, declining and uh, also something that's uh, in a phase of nostalgia. Uh, it, it, it wants to go back to its golden days. And there's there are constant comparisons with Hindi, of course. So, I think so, so, we can go, we can go on, but I think we can talk to Okay, so I think Anonna Pal, you have your answer from Madam. And uh, okay, another question is also regarding the Urdu language in custody. Um, I think Madam has already answered the question. Anything else apart from that? I just want I to, re to re uh, reiterate, reiterate uh, what I was saying during the discussion as well, which is uh, that in the novel, language is conflated with masculinity. So that's something you might want to remember when you are looking at the language. Language is always tied up with uh, culture and representation. And so 
the decline of the Urdu language is somehow also staged through the body of the Urdu poet Noor. So that's something uh, that I think Desai has done very successfully. And if you remember the uh, image of the uh, Hijra as well. So there seems to be a, a collapsing between these two ideas, language and the male body within the context of the novel. So that's something you might want to remember as well when you're looking at the language uh, in, in, in custody. So yeah, that's, that's it. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, so another question is there from Biplav Pal and he is asking, in the novel in custody, what makes Devin the true custodian of the Urdu language? Is he, the, is he the true custodian is what I'm thinking because the way the novel ends, uh, Devin considers it a burden, an honor but also a burden and he's not sure if he can carry it around. He's not even sure if he'll have the job. Uh, so Desai is very clearly ending this on a note where in custody, uh, has connotations of being in prison, right? Uh, so, is he a true custodian? Is something that you might want to ask again. So, yeah. uh, there's uh, another, there's another, yeah, existentialism, existentialism depicted in custody. I, I think, I, I think the focus, focus was on masculinities, on but you could take the same set of questions and ask the same. But uh, when you ask the question of existentialism, uh, you also need to remember that existentialism does not exist in a vacuum. There are specific socio-cultural historical formations which underpin it. And I think that was one of the points that I uh, was trying to make when I was talking about what literary masculinity studies does. So it locates, literary masculinity studies locates uh, certain universal ideas. So existentialism could be a universal idea, uh, which I think can be challenged by masculinity studies. If you want to pin it on a particular person, in this case, Devin, uh, then you need to also look at his position vis-a-vis -vis society, uh, the vulnerabilities that he's, fa that he's faced with as a male and so on. So I think existentialism uh, is something that needs to be qualified in this case. Uh, and masculinity studies could provide uh, you with that tool to qualify uh, his existential crisis, if, it, if at all it could be called that. OK, so thank you very much, Mary, for answering all these questions from the listeners. And uh, I think that yeah, I think that this is the end of the uh, day one of the online lecture series. And thank you. so again, I want to uh, heartily thank you for uh, joining us today and for enlightening us for your wonderful lecture. And we hope that in our future ventures also, we will have you as our speaker and we will have this wonder kind of wonderful kind of interpretation of so many texts from you. So thank you, madam. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I also want to thank, thank Moshumi, madam. Moshumi, madam. I, I failed to mention her in the beginning. She has been, in, been touch in touch throughout. throughout. Uh, I also want to thank, also thank her for helping, for helping organize this. Thank you. Thank, thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. Thank you. And last of all, I want to thank our uh, patron, uh, Dr. Shoma Dotta, principal, Kandi Raj College, and also we are very thankful to our convener, Mrs. Moshumi Dash, head of the department of Department of English, uh, Gandhi Raj College, and our fellow faculties, uh, P. Ali Shorkar, assistant professor, and Zareen Tashneem, assistant professor. And also, we are very thankful for IQAC, the other faculty members of the college, and especially our students. Our students, we are very much thankful to them. All of you have participated in this wonderful lecture series. 
and thankful to uh, every scholar and teacher who have participated in this YouTube online lecture series. And thank we end up here and with the very particular message that next day, I mean in day two, we will have Mrs. Gargi Bhattacharya as the speaker who will be delivering her lecture on Amitabha Bose's The Shadow Line. So in this note, we'll be forward to that. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.